सुविधा स्वास्थ्य और पर्यावरण का ध्यान जीवन का आज यही मंत्र है महान सच ये है बहुत बड़ा ना भूलेंगे कभी कह रही है ये जमी और सारा आसमान अपना साफ रखना भी जरूरी करना है जीवन का हमको सन्मान अपना ध्यान मंत्र हाथ धुलेंगे मास्क लगेंगे बनी रहेगी एक मुस्कान समाज अपनी भाषा में ही आता है कंटेंट आपकी भाषा में ओनली ऑन डेली हंट हमें पता है आपको क्या चाहिए अपनी पसंद का कंटेंट ओनली ऑन डेली हंट रखो अपने एरिया की खबर लोकल अपडेट्स ओनली ऑन डेली हंट वेलकम बैक टू द फ्रंट लॉन फ्रॉम डिग्गी पैलेस एट द फोर्टीन जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डिटॉल टुडे सेशन इज प्रोटेक्टेड बाय रैकेट बेन काइजर इट इज आर प्लेजर टू प्रेजेंट टिल वी विन इंडिया फाइट अगेंस्ट द कोविड नाइन्टीन पैंडेमिक रनदीप गुलेरिया चंद्रकांत लहेरिया एंड गगनदीप कांग इन कॉन्वर्सेशन विद माया मीर चंदानी Will India win the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic? When can we expect a safe and effective vaccine? How should we respond to this new normal? As an individual and as a community, what is the way forward? Offering insights on how India continues to fight the pandemic till we win is a must read for everyone. A detailed objective and hopeful account of our times. This is a book for the people, for political leaders, policy makers, and physicians with the promise and potential to transform public health in India. Dr. Randeep Guleria, director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, has been at the forefront of the government of India's efforts on the COVID-19 pandemic preparedness and response. Dr. Chandrakant Lahiria is a leading public policy and health systems expert and a recipient of the Indian Council of Medical Researchers Dr. B C Shrivastha Foundation Award for his work on translating community based health research in public policy interventions. Dr. Gagandeep Kang is a renowned infectious disease researcher and virologist who serves on many advisory committees in India and internationally including for the World Health Organization. the co-authors discuss the exciting new project in conversation with award winning journalist maya mirchandani randeep guleria director of all india institute of medical sciences is an md in medicine and the first dm in pulmonary medicine in the country he has been a member of joint monitoring group of government of india created for pandemic and outbreak management in india since 2005 and has been at the forefront of the government of india's efforts on covid-19 pandemic preparedness and response in the country chandrakant lahiria is a medical doctor and one of india's leading public policy vaccines and health systems expert In addition to conducting primary research and publishing in medical journals his work on epidemics and pandemics is a unique blend of academic research field response and policy work Gagandeep Kang is an infectious disease researcher who links community based research to high quality laboratory investigation with 30 years of research at the Christian Medical College Dr Kang has built collaborative programs focused on enteric diseases nutrition and the environment she supported the development of two 
rotavirus vaccines made by Indian companies through clinical and laboratory testing. In 2019, she became the first woman working in India to be inducted as a Fellow of Royal Society London. Maya Meer Chandani is an award-winning Indian journalist. She now teaches media studies at Ashoka University and is a senior fellow at Delhi-based Observer Research Foundation. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Till We Win, India's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, Randeep Guleria, Chandrakant Leheria and Gagandeep Kang in conversation with Maya Meechandani. Over to you, Maya. Hello and welcome and thank you all very much for joining this very special session of the Jaipur Literary Festival uh, titled Till We Win, India's Fight Against the Pandemic. It's a beautiful spring morning and spring always sort of gives us hope. Hope is something we've been talking about for the better part of the last year. Hope for a way forward uh, from the gloom of a pandemic. Hope with the talk of a vaccine right now. And what better opportunity to talk about uh, you know, how we're going to move forward in 2021 than this, this wonderful panel of three doctors. Uh, the whole book is about trees and, you know, sort of the recommendations of test, trace, treat. But this, to start with, we have the three doctors who I think are the focus of everyone's attention in the country. And it's great to have all of you on a panel together. Uh, just a heads up before we actually get into the conversation, I've already been receiving questions uh, from people who are signing on to this conversation well before anything has started. Um, but um, I'd like to actually start with you, Dr. Laheria, because from everything I've read in the introductions and, and the preface of this book, it seems that the idea to collate this material over the last year, you know, was something that you talked about and you roped in Dr. Kang and Dr. Guleria into this wonderful uh, project that's going to be sort of a testament uh, to the times that we live in. What made you think of doing this? So the pandemic posed a really a big challenge and everybody was affected. And uh, we realized that pandemic can be fought only with the right kind of information. And that right kind of information can, uh, can come from the people who are actually involved and understand the in in nitty gritty of this work. So the pandemic was happening due to a virus. It was affecting people. It was burdening healthcare system. So a uh, number of people were asking me and uh, also other colleagues to write something about this. But we realized that uh, this information had to come from the authentic sources and had to a uh, blend of uh, epidemiology. We need to explain epidemiology to the people. We need to explain why and how virus happens. And we need to explain to the people that uh, not only that they need to do a particular behavior of hand washing or social distancing or physical distancing or face masks, but it, is, it was important, that's what we realized, that we tell them that why they need to do these things and that will help in adapting that kind of behavior. So uh, three months down the pandemic, when it was clear that the pandemic is going to stay for a while, I had a discussion with Dr. Randeep Guleria and Dr. Gagandeep Kang because Dr. Guleria is at the forefront of this work and he's a leading clinician and was working, uh, was involved in the clinical work and Dr. Kang, is a leading virologist and I work in the field of uh, public health and health systems. And so we thought that if three of us can come together and write a comprehensive story with our years of experience in this field, I guess that will carry a little more value and it will provide us an opportunity to talk to the all a varied group of stakeholders. So we wanted to talk to the not only general public to tell what they should know, but we also wanted to derive some lessons for the future that we, that this pandemic would be over. Hmm. But what lessons we can carry uh, from this pandemic to strengthen India's healthcare system. And I personally thought that I could have written, Dr. Goleria alone could have written this book or Dr. Kang alone could have written this book, but the account would not have been authentic unless we three would have come together. And, and I, I really that's... appreciate that uh, Dr. Goleria and Dr. Kang agreed to join in this endeavor and then rest is history, as they say. Right. And I think it truly is remarkable that that uh, you all work together on this. Dr. Kang, if I may come to you, um, you know, we've been when I was going through the book, actually, uh, I, a part of me wished that it had actually it had come out sooner. 
because there's information that's relevant every day and i think one of you mentioned also how you know you go to bed at night and by the morning what you've learned the previous night also has kind of evolved and changed the next morning so from the time the book was published to where we are today uh, especially as far as the vaccine story is concerned um do you think that you'd like to add in more information from your perspective thanks for that question maya um it is always an evolving story at the time that the book was written we didn't we knew about variants we didn't know how important they would become in terms of studying the vaccine response i think we still don't have a handle on that at the moment uh we have had a lot of data emerge on the vaccines on what is the right kind of dosing schedule uh, which vaccines are working and what kinds of situations so absolutely i think we are going to need to keep updating this in an easy to follow mechanism somehow and soon mhm mm Dr Guleria you've been at the sort of uh, front lines of uh, you know what we're seeing happen in terms of policy in delhi but also i think as a delhi resident uh you know we we tune in to your q and a sessions on tv on a regular basis because you've broken down and made things easy for uh, all of us to understand in in extremely clear language for the last year but i'd like to ask you as somebody who's you know a, a a practicing doctor leading india's primary uh, medical facility this pandemic is taking place in an age of digital communication do you think that sometimes the kind of information that's been circulating and the different channels that the information has been coming from um has been an impediment because this book actually you know busts a lot of myths as well about the kind of stuff we've been hearing from family groups and uh you know natural naturalists and naturopathists and things like that and you you say okay fine we can drink the kada and we can have the haldi and all that but listen this is a medical situation this needs a medical response and we need to sift the public has has been forced to actually sift fact from myth on a on a daily basis you know what if this had taken place in a non digital age so that's true i think we need to understand that uh, in today's time we're actually fighting two pandemics one is the pandemic because of covid 19 and the other is the infodemic the pandemic because of media, media social media and a lot of information available which is never authenticated we don't even know whether it's right but it goes viral and then people start believing that as it sort of gets mixed with half truths and that causes a huge problem because from the early days of the pandemic this led to a huge panic reaction which will happen it led to a lot of stigma it led to people um, getting worried and not coming to the hospital because they thought that the facilities there would really make them more sick and now we're seeing that even with the vaccination that because of all the let's say uh, social media information that people get through uh, about the vaccination there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy it's likely that if we had hmm. gone seen this uh, uh, before the it era things may not have been that bad but uh, this has always been there and i'll just uh, uh, give you an example of something which happened uh, almost uh, in the eight, in, in the late 1800 uh, when the smallpox vaccine was started that was the first time that edward jenner started the smallpox vaccine by using what was known as cowpox and there were a lot of uh, paintings done at that time trying to show that if you took this cowpox vaccine to eradicate smallpox you would have cow's head growing on your arms or on your body and things like that which was creating a panic even at that point in time so there has always been some degree of uh, misinformation but it reached a huge uh, uh, magnitude and capacity during this time because of the freedom of the internet because of what social media has really become and the fact that this is like the wild west there is really no control of it mm. and that is why there was a huge challenge of not only dealing with the pandemic but getting the right information across and this is not only something that happened in india this is a global phenomenon mm. even if you look at the situation in the us 
the the importance of mass was really uh, not something which people accepted because of what was there in the media and what was said by a lot of uh, people at different quarters so there has been a challenge both as far as the pandemic is concerned and the information epidemic that we had to deal last year right dr kang let me bring uh, you back in on that because the the vaccine hesitancy for example is something that we we're, we're seeing play out in uh, the new space as well on a regular basis do you think that that has to do with the fact that you know traditionally we were kind of conditioned to believing that vaccines take years to develop so how come suddenly people have managed to come up with something in under a year do you think it has to do with the fact that people need to be made aware or policy you know uh, medical professionals and policy makers need to be more transparent about the way uh, the trials have taken place i mean wh what do you think is contributing to the vaccine hesitancy is there real reason for it or can we kind of surmount this because is that the only way forward towards ending the pandemic i think vaccine hesitancy encompasses a lot of different things there are people who believe that uh, vaccines are dangerous and have that feeling about pretty much all vaccines there are people who have doubts about vaccines because they feel like they have inadequate information and that's a completely different class of people and then there are people who don't know what they don't know hmm. so in previous surveys that have been done in india most of our immunization program is focused on routine immunization and it was found that the largest chunk of people who did not immunize their children did not do it because they thought vaccines were dangerous but because they didn't know about the importance of vaccines and the fact that vaccines could protect their uh, children from disease they did not know when vaccinations were happening they did not know where they needed to go to get information so there is a lack of information there is um, a lack of information in this situation and there are doubts about vaccines and all three are different I think the ones that can be easily addressed is people who at least feel like they have inadequate information or don't know they have information and we can do that by providing information to them so that there is a trust in the government and in the vaccines that the government is putting out mm. now the government has developed an, a really outstanding communication policy and I, quite frankly i was delighted to see the policy at the end of december when it was released but in real life if i talk to people or receive questions from people that communication strategy does not seem to be implemented in the way that it has been designed a lot of people really don't know that to develop these vaccines we are building on the work that we started with sars that right. we are using things that we learned from the mers coronavirus so actually these vaccines and the methods that we are using to develop these vaccines are something that we have been working on for about a decade and a half so hmm. whether it is dna vaccines or mrna vaccines or the vectored vaccines this is not new knowledge that came into being in the space of a year it's only hmm. the testing of these vaccines has been done really really quickly and the reason that we have been able to do that is really two large reasons one reason is vaccines are a hugely expensive investment so usually when we develop a vaccine we do one phase we wait for the next one because we want each phase to be successful before we go to the next phase here we've taken money and thrown it at the problem at, to solve any problem that money can solve that's been done whether it is taking risk in making doses of vaccines before they are licensed or testing very many more people in clinical trials than would ordinarily be done in order to shorten the time frame so one is solving all the problems money can solve 
The other one is regulatory process where we have essentially done, instead of doing things in sequence, we've done them in parallel. And that has allowed us to significantly shorten timelines, but no step of the vaccine development process has been bypassed in any shape or form. In fact, some of the packages that are being submitted even for emergency use authorization to the FDA are much larger than packages that would be submitted for biological licensure applications for other vaccines. 30,000 people, 45,000 people, these are huge clinical trials. 130, 175 readouts for a clinical trial. Those are enormous numbers. And that's why we can rely on the results of trials where efficacy has been proven. Right. Dr. Laheria, let me bring you into the conversation because, um, you know, you work uh, a lot in community health systems as well. And the, the sort of uh, deployment of the vaccine amongst large swathes of the population in a country like India, where you have the infodemic that Dr. Guleria talked about, or the vaccine skepticism that Dr. Kang is talking about, um, for whatever reason, how, how do people people like you actually work on creating policy where you are, um, you know, being able to do your job in the interest of public health. I mean, and just to throw in another example from your book as well that you all talk about early last year when the cases began to rise and there was a sort of stigmatization that was taking place of people who were found COVID positive and this was playing out as well. So, you know, you have all these elements of human behavior that are kind of coming in the way of medicine in, in a manner of speaking. Yeah, so uh, as we have heard from other two speakers as well, that uh, the hesitancy toward vaccines or uh, public health interventions has been part of the history of vaccination programs and other programs, starting with the smallpox or also very recently in the polio elimination program, we had seen that there was a lot of reluctance. And in such a initiatives which are large scale where the intention is to reach a really a big number of people there would be a smaller number of people who are hesitant and reluctant mm -hmm. so what so we have derived the, some of the learnings and from experience of, of those programs that's one secondly that uh, in such large scale program the communication is the key strategy to reach to those people and uh, these communication strategy had to be really timely trustworthy, and also based upon the evidence which we generate as part of the process. For example, even before the COVID-19 vaccines were licensed in India, one uh, policy think tank in Delhi conducted a sub telephonic survey of a group of people starting 26 December to 4 January and asked them if a vaccine becomes available, will they be willing to take that vaccine? And what they found that around 40% of people were either saying no or maybe. So that kind of phenomena exists. So the, I, the approach has to be that we learn from the past experiences, that we read to the key stakeholder, we involve the influencers, and we do all the things to reach those tar target population. It, it, it's also equally important that uh, we need to identify where and which subgroup it is. So that's how it should be done. To conclude this part, I would say that uh, uh, we have some learning even from the pandemic response, so to say. We know that at the beginning of the pandemic, the behavior of the people toward the COVID, appropriate, uh, COVID uh, prevention strategy of hand washing, physical distancing, or uh, face mask was uh, very low, like limited number of people were utilizing. But the repeated communication when the people were reading newspaper, they see the same message. When they pick up the phone, they hear the same message. When they watch TV, the same, similar message being passed on. And now we know that a year into the pandemic, at least a, a good number of people have ingrained that kind of behavior, which was so challenging. So we need to learn and derive those learnings. Similarly, you read about the issue of stigma and discrimination. So in such kind of pandemic response, large scale program, it's important that policymakers, the technical experts and the community members, all of them come together. And hmm. it had to be ongoing learning. The way we have tackled some of the challenges in people not wearing face masks, Similar lessons need to be derived and I'm fairly confident that the vaccine hesitancy which we are facing or seeing 
to an extent. It has already been partially addressed and it will be addressed in day to come. Okay, Dr. Guleria, let me bring you back in on this because I mean, you know, the conversations, especially after Delhi conducted its zero surveys, for example, was about how uh, the capital had almost hit herd immunity. Uh, that was, you know, one of the narratives that we heard. Firstly, what does that mean when it comes to vaccine deployment in, in that context? And secondly, what does this herd immunity mean when all of you are also worried about new, more infectious strains? Um, you know, are we going to see a situation where the the writing, the, you know, your book and the lessons we've learned from last year, actually we're going to find a, a rollback to what we saw last year with these strains? I think that's a genuine concern that people have. So I agree that is a genuine concern and a lot of people are worried that uh, what is going to happen with new and newer and newer strains emerging. So firstly, mm -hmm. I think herd immunity is something that is going to be very, very difficult to achieve and it's something that one should not really think of in practical terms. Because when you are talking of herd immunity, you're wanting to have almost 70 to 80 percent of individuals uh, having uh, good immunity because of exposure to the disease and thereby breaking the chain of transmission and not allowing the disease to spread to those who have not, the, those who are susceptible uh, are protected by those who have got uh, antibodies and are not able to spread the disease to them. So this scenario can change rapidly because as you rightly said, the variant strains and waning immunity with time can lead to a chance that people may have uh, reinfection or get infection again. And this is something that has also been seen to some extent in Brazil, in the city of Manus, where they had claimed that they had got herd immunity with almost 70% of the population being protected uh, because of past infection. And yet because of the Brazilian variant and waning immunity, a large number of people got infected again and now they're in a very bad situation because of again a resurgence of cases. So I think it's very important for us to understand that we need to learn from that and should not be complacent. We should not really lower our guard and not really look at that we, that the zero survey showed this today. And the zero survey, if you look at the Indian zero survey, the globe the, from the entire country, it does not suggest that we're anywhere near herd immunity, even if you look at the number of 70 right. to 80 persons. So therefore, it's not going to be something that is going to be achievable. And you should one should also remember that large number of people have mild infection. And we do know that those who have mm. mild infection tend to have a less antibody production. Their antibody tends to wane over a period of time. And therefore, we are not sure that those people who had infection, let's say in April or May uh, of last year, what is the degree of protection do they have right now if we don't vaccinate them? Therefore, vaccination becomes more and more important. And as we go along the journey of vaccination, the vaccines will also change to take care of the variants that emerge. And we will continue to have newer and newer generation of vaccines, which could tackle not only the variants, but give us more robust immunity, which could last for a longer period of time. So what we have today is not the only vaccines. We will have better vaccines as time uh, moves on and as research moves on. But right now, we should take what we have if we want to really make sure that the situation in our country does not deteriorate. And that's why I think two or three things are very important right now. One is trying to develop a strategy that we're able to vaccinate as many people as possible, keeping in mind our priority list. Continue to aggressively have good communication strategy so that COVID appropriate behavior is something that we all follow. We have stopped following that in many parts of our country. People have stopped wearing masks and that itself can be something which can really lead to a flare up of infection to, in various parts of the country. And thirdly, do not to forget our initial strategy of testing, tracking, isolating and quarantine, uh, quarantining people so that we are, we break, uh, don't allow the infection to spread. We are seeing clusters developing in Maharashtra, in Keral, in Chhattisgarh, in Punjab. We really need to act aggressively to prevent that. Right. In fact, Dr. Khan, let me come to you with that question as well. You know, um, all of us in the last year have become uh, Google doctors, like I, I like to use the term Google doctors because we have no expertise and yet we talk about a pandemic as though we know it all. Um, but I'd like to ask you, as somebody who works in infectious diseases, everyone talks about how viruses mutate, that people should not be surprised by the fact that there are new mutations and new strains. I mean, even the flu that we sort of deal with every year changes from one year to the next. And 
but but each time we hear about a new strain of covid-19 um we hear you know there is an element of panic uh, that sets in as well in terms of how we receive it so are we at a stage where we can kind of absorb the shock of new strains without being alarmed uh, should we as dr guleria was talking about new strains and you know clusters in maharashtra etc do you think that there should be another sort of lockdown or restrictions on travel imposed again how do we actually come out of this state of constant anxiety and panic i think we come out of a state of anxiety and panic when we calibrate our response to the threats that we perceive viruses will evolve all the time and some viruses will acquire qualities that may increase their ability to be a threat to public health many viruses will acquire mutations that will lead to those strains dying out or will not in any way influence the ability of that virus to spread or cause more severe disease over time most viruses will acquire mutations that allow them to spread more easily that's their goal they want to be able to reproduce and infect new hosts but they don't want to be killing hosts so many viruses as they evolve tend to evolve in a way that leads to them being more transmissible and causing less severe disease they mm. become more severe as in the case of influenza when they acquire characteristics that come largely from other species that's why we worry so much about bird flu because we think bird flu will be much more dangerous than the strains of human flu that are circulating so the one thing to remember is that viruses have can mutate more if there are more viruses around and more viruses replicating so everything that we do to reduce the global amount of virus that is present in the world and that is test trace isolate limit spread of viruses vaccinate people so that viruses multiply less is going to lead to fewer mutations and we need to understand hmm. that all of us have a role to play in this if we keep doing that then we avoid the more restrictive public health measures that you mentioned which is thinking about border closures and lockdowns that really is dependent on an ability to suppress replication of the virus in our locations hmm. and globally right uh, dr leheria in fact this idea of how india has many parts of india is now behaving as though the pandemic is over as dr guleria said that people are not wearing masks anymore uh, there's a lot more interaction social interaction that's kicked off in in delhi where i am it's it's sort of wedding season and people are gathering on a, on a weekly if not nightly basis as well um you know is this do you think one question caused by pandemic fatigue i mean are people just tired and want to get back to their lives in some way is there going to be a new normal for this and the second question that i have for you when i think you can take this one first is across the world we're actually getting questions to india is how come india has done better than western europe or the united states and what is the answer to that question have we done better well uh, let me answer both the question tangentially and then connect those two okay great so the first party that i guess uh, when we are hearing people are not following those behavior or people are behaving in a particular way it somewhere originate also in the how strong a health care health care system a country has and what i mean what we are hearing in this pandemic that uh, the countries which have a stronger primary health care system stronger public health care system are done relatively better than the health care system which are medicalized where people only sick people are treated and now when we talk in generic terms that what primary health care system or public health care system is it essentially means that there is a stronger connect between the community and population and health care provider and facility the facilities are closer the there are frontline workers who have a regular contact with the people and in that kind of system 
which is primary healthcare, frontline workers, regular connection between doctor and healthcare provider, uh, community and healthcare provider, people are more likely to follow and adhere the advice. And if the system is not primary healthcare based or system is really weak, then people will follow whatever they think is right for them. And that's what probably is happening. And so the, my first point is that while it's important that we discuss about the pandemic uh, being fought and countries fighting for the pandemic and we will win. However, I want to take utilize this opportunity where uh, so many learned people are listening to this discussion that we should learn lessons from this pandemic. And uh, this should result in the initiation of that dialogue which transform India's healthcare system. If we don't use the learning and challenges posed by the pandemic to initiate the healthcare system transition or transformation in the country, that will be a missed opportunity. So that's the part one. Hmm. Second part of the question, why and how India is doing better? Uh, I guess uh, the jury is still out, but my broader point is that, that we cannot say that uh, we are out of the pandemic till entire world is out of the pandemic. So though at this uh, certain point of time, we are doing better and which is a good thing, but we should pull our resources together and we should, should we prepare that this does not happen. And that requires uh, interventions by government uh, to invest in healthcare system, take those policies, but also people should be, uh, community has a played impact, important role in the pandemic response till now. And we, this is expected that they would continue to play. But finally, I would like to also to conclude that this is not the only pandemic. Uh, we know that pandemic is a reality of the time, epidemic outbreaks. So uh, though we may win against this, but if we don't prepare, if we don't understand that the kind of challenges and what kind of health systems are needed, there could be a pandemic sooner than we can imagine. And then again, we would be in that situation. So this pandemic gives us opportunity to learn for the future. And this is a plea for policymakers, civil society, and people that we need to continue and learn and fight this till the pandemic is over from all parts of the world. Right. I think that's an important message that the pandemic isn't over till it's eradicated globally. And the, the sort of complacency with which uh, uh, many people feel that, you know, because India has done better, uh, there is something to, to rejoice about in this moment in time might be a little premature. Uh, Dr. Guleria, if I can actually um, ask you, I mean, we're getting questions in from the audience as well. Just a few minutes left. I've woven a lot of them into the conversation. But people are asking whether you know, how can they travel responsibly now that travel constraints have eased? That's one question that's being asked. The second is, you know, are there any other new uh, medicines in case of people who have not been able to take the vaccine? Is there any other treatment protocol that's emerged that people can follow? Uh, you know, just because, as you said, it's not over yet. So I think two very important questions. The first issue is uh, regarding travel. And I would still say that since the pandemic is not over, uh, avoid non-essential travel if you can, and especially to areas where with various where increasing number of cases are being reported. So that is an important thing. And if you are traveling, then wearing a mask, using COVID appropriate behavior becomes more and more important. You can't avoid the uh, physical uh, distance uh, that you would like to have because in, while traveling, especially even if you take a flight or you're going by train, uh, that becomes very, very difficult. But if you protect yourself well, you know, if you have a, a good mask, you're wearing a shield, that itself will protect you because this is a droplet infection. The mm. chance of the infection really occurring to surface, surfaces is not that strong. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. The other thing is that we really don't have a very good effective antiviral drug as of now. We have some monoclonal antibodies, which may be useful in mild illness, but have not been shown to be useful in moderate or severe illness. And there is a lot of research being done to develop good antivirals, which would be really effective against uh, COVID-19. Uh, vaccine development has moved far ahead than has the development of uh, antivirals, which are effective against COVID-19. Hmm. However, having said that, we've learned a lot in the last one year as to what works and what doesn't work. And we've had better treatment strategies. And that is actually reflected in a decline in mortality which has happened in the later part of last year as to what was seen in the early or the middle part of last year. So I think that there has been uh, better treatment strategies. 
but I still think there is a lot of research we need to do and more aggressively as we did for vaccine for better therapeutics as far as COVID-19 is concerned. But still we have that. We must be very careful about uh, protecting ourselves and that is why the non-essential travel one should still try and avoid at least for the next few months till the picture becomes more and more clear. So um, we just have five minutes. Dr. Kang, will the picture become clear soon according to you? I mean... In, as, as vaccine deployment becomes. And I think a, a sort of linked to that is a question that many people are asking about why uh, the private sector is also not being brought in as far as vaccine deployment is concerned, uh, why we are exporting more vaccines than we're administering in India. I think these are questions that the general public also uh, is looking for answers to. I think the picture becomes clearer every day. And this is a challenge because each time you get some clarity, it feels like what you were doing previously was not accurate or not correct. And that's, I think, one of the things we have to deal with in a situation that is still evolving. Um, in terms of vaccine distribution and whether vaccines should stay in India and everybody in India should be vaccinated first before we let vaccines out, I think involving the private sector is a good thing. Um, I know that the government has had a very top-down strategy so far to the delivery of vaccines, but the government's resources are not infinite. And I think drawing in people, uh, companies, people who want to volunteer, these are approaches that we should be looking at so that we distribute the burden of distribution of vaccines to as wide a number of players as possible so that we can accelerate the pace at which we are rolling out vaccines. And I hope that that will happen soon. There is a lot of expertise in the private sector and to give them responsibility, I think would be good on the part of the government. In terms of vaccine distribution, I think one thing that is important to remember is that the vaccine has two goals. One is to save lives and the other is to stop the spread of disease, right? Now, if we look at the goal of saving lives, where are people dying? The number of people that are dying in India at this time is relatively low. So if we think about the priorities that the world has come up with, India included, the prioritization has been how do we prevent deaths? If we think in that kind of global mindset, it makes sense no doses of vaccines distributed around the world are going to waste. They are protecting people in other parts of the world. And that's our responsibility as global citizens. What should hmm. the proportion be? Should it be 80, 20? Should it be something else? I think that is up to the government to decide how it wants to do this. But I definitely think that we are very lucky, very fortunate to have lots of vaccine providers in the country, and we should be sharing our vaccines with the world. Right. Um, Dr. Leheria, on that note, I mean, the, the sort of issue of the deployment and the distribution, you know, people are asking whether this can be speeded up. And while we talk about mRNA vaccines that require extreme cold chains or the virus vector vaccine, I mean, we're all familiar with this language rolls off our tongues, as you mentioned uh, in your book as well. But there's also talk of an inhaled vaccine now that's also coming up. I mean, if that were to happen, then the ASHA workers who are like the frontline workers in many Indian communities, then they would also be able to be roped into the distribution system, I imagine. But we're far from that, right? Well, yeah. So uh, inhaled vaccine licensing is still far from uh, uh, a few months away, at least. And what we know that we already have a few vaccines which are licensed and available. So the first priority attention had to be utilizing those vaccines. Second part is, as far as ASHA worker and other workers, of course, in the injectable vaccines are given by the ind individual who are trained to administer the vaccine. But the frontline workers such as ASHA and Anganwadi worker has an important role even in the ongoing vaccination program because they are the they are in 
connection uh, connected to the family and they are in the regular touch with the these communities and they can pass on those messages about the vaccine and that will motivate people to come to the vaccination center to receive the vaccine so they have a important uh, role in ongoing vaccination drive to educate and make aware about the ongoing vaccination drive what happens three months down the lane maybe there is a one single dose vaccine which will also make the process faster and there would be sufficient vaccine so things would evolve but the current challenge is that we utilize each and every resource uh, to ensure that vaccines reach to the arm of the more number of people well in the meanwhile as we as we sort of uh, you know continue waging this war against covid-19 i think it's important to remember that as you all said the pandemic isn't over it doesn't mean we stop the precautions stop keeping distance or wearing our masks or washing our hands and of course going out Uh, and getting till we win uh, so that you if you if you forget anything you have a ready reference from uh, india's top doctors uh, who will be able to guide you dr kang dr leheria dr guleria thank you all so much for being part of this session the questions will not end uh, but we may have to take them offline so thank you all very much thank for being you. a part of this thank you thank you dr guleria dr leheria and dr kang and of course maya meechandani for helping us to understand better our fight against the pandemic through this objective and hopeful discussion thank you so much we thank our partners rocket band kaiser for supporting the session we would also like to thank our celebration partner diageo and if you all enjoyed the session please do pick up your copy of the book from the amazon bookstore and if you are in the mood for some retail therapy then please do check out our merchandise partner earth fables do continue to stay logged on to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that we have specially curated for you please do tweet using hashtag #jaipur literature festival 2021 and do tag us at jaipur lit fest we do hope to see you in our next session अपना ध्यान मंत्र महान देश रहेगा स्वच्छता स्वास्थ्य और पर्यावरण का ध्यान जीवन का आज यही मंत्र है महान सच ये है बहुत बड़ा ना भूलेंगे कभी कह रही है ये जमी और सारा आसमान अपना साफ रखना भी जरूरी करना है जीवन का हमको सन्मान अपना ध्यान मंत्र हाथ धुलेंगे मास्क लगेंगे बनी रहेगी एक मुस्कान Yeah